presentation is on writing a case study, which is a very important topic to all clinicians who uh, are involved with patient care and have an opportunity to see unique cases, both diagnostically and therapeutically. And today to speak on this topic is Dr. Theodore Johnson. And Dr. Johnson has written many case studies on a wide variety of topics. And he's uh, an expert in the practical application of writing case studies. So Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Welcome, everyone, to my uh, my talk called Writing a Clinical Case Report. And what I'm going to try to do is uh, do an informal talk about my process in the way of writing a case report. I'm going to outline step-by-step -step my method of writing a case report, and hopefully that will help those of you who are in attendance uh, who are thinking about writing a case report and haven't done so or who have written a case report and would like to get another uh, view of uh, doing the going through the process. So hang in there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to either type them in and we'll try to get back to you as best we can. Okay, first question you have to ask yourself when you're thinking about writing the case report is where do I start? Well, this picture, I don't look like that anymore, but this picture takes me back to the age of when I was down at the Chicago General Health Service, mm, early 90s, 1994. My first case report was actually produced in the year 1994, and uh, that was the first case that I had attempted to do. I was starting from scratch. I had never written a case report before. Um, so how did I start? Well, I had an idea. Interesting case that happened to come through the clinic. And light bulb moment hit me and I said, okay, that's a nice case and I think it should be published. I think the profession would learn something from it. And of course, I learned quite a bit about uh, the whole subject matter in which I had produced the case. So first of all, you have to have an idea, a good case. Once you've identified the case, what's the next step? Look at your medical record pertaining to that case. Is the medical record complete? When I say complete, do you have all the essential elements in the case from start to finish? Is the history complete? Is the physical exam complete? Laboratory supporting our information complete? Do you have that? If you don't have that, then what do you have to do? You'll have to make sure that those blanks are filled in in some way or some how. Here's a step-by-step -step look at the medical record uh, as far as looking at items that you might want to consider as far as assessing whether or not you have a good case to write up on because your case report is going to hinge on the information that you have. Um, a good case report is uh, well documented from start to finish, not just the literature review and all of that, but you have to outline what you did with the patient from a historical point of view, from a physical exam point of view, and if it's a therapeutic intervention, then you'll have to outline that as well. So make sure you have the information complete. Starting with the history. Is the history complete? I mean, not just the present illness or chief complaint, but social aspects family medical history, past medical history, surgical history, medication history, all of those items have to be considered, social history. Um, now looking at the next step, past medical history, obviously social history, all those historical items have to be filled in for a good case. Look at your physical examination. Is it complete? Do you have the vitals? Oftentimes I've looked at as a reviewer, I've reviewed several case reports in the past, and one of the things I first look at is the case report, and I look at, well, did the doctor um, record the vitals on this patient? And if, if not, why not? So it starts there. 
Uh, if he identified or he or she identified some particular uh, orthopedic test, uh, that the doctor described the test in a meaningful way, that someone else could actually perform the test if they wanted to. So that's the kind of information that we're looking at in the physical examination, and that must be uh, well documented and recorded. And lastly, labs or imaging reports to support uh, if it's a diagnostic case, then you would certainly want to have that information available. So once you have completed the medical record and you're sure that it's complete, what's the next step? Well, the next step in the process, you've got your idea, you have uh, confirmed the medical record is complete, now you have to perform your literature search and start retrieving the literature. Now, how are you going to start your literature search? First, you have to decide what kind of case reports you're going to write. Is it going to be based on a diagnostic uh, finding or sign or symptom, or is it a therapeutic intervention? And from there, you pick out some keywords. Is it a diagnosis? If it's a diagnostic finding or diagnosis, established diagnosis, then that's probably pretty easy. But you have to be familiar with the types of terms that are used in uh, the different types of uh, search engines as well. A sign, again, you have to be familiar with uh, the proper uh, delineation of the sign that's used in the broad uh, arena of the literature. Next, I like to use PubMed. That's just my personal, personal uh, favorite because I have just become familiar with it. And I have become familiar with uh, using mesh terms and how to use the Boolean searches and or and all that sort of thing. So that works pretty well for me. You might have a different uh, search en engine that you might want to use, or you might do a combination thereof. So where I start, I start with once I've got my, um, whether it's a diagnostic finding, usually it's a diagnosis, perhaps, and my first case report was on prostate cancer, so it was pretty easy. Just plugged in the word uh, prostate cancer or prostate carcinoma. I usually will use those two words interchangeably, interchangeably, cancer and carcinoma. So I'll start with PubMed. And next, from PubMed, uh, plug in the words, and typically I'll, you will get uh, hits of maybe anywhere from a thousand to a couple of thousand, and I put limits on that search to make it relevant to maybe the last five years and human versus English language and all that sort of thing to just narrow it down so I won't, won't become so overwhelming. And you go through each one of those and you find the ones that are relevant and pertinent to, pertinent to what you want to say and what you want to discuss. Put those on your clipboard, save them, and here at National, we have a remarkable <laughs> retrieval system called Peggy Carey. <laughs> so once I have saved my clipboard, I usually it's saved in a Word uh, or a PDF file, and I just send that off to Peggy at the library. And within a week, week or two, she has retrieved all the articles that I have uh, requested of her, and she sent those to my attention. She's done the, the hard work. That's the hard work. In my in my opinion, anyway. And next, once I've gotten the articles, what's my next step? You've got a whole box of articles. Usually, uh, by the time I've retrieved all those articles, they can range from anywhere from 250 to 300 articles on a particular case. So what do I do now? i got all of these articles. So I think the next slide that's coming up is going to show you my the method to my madness, if you will. I hope it will, anyway. Um, but before we get there, it's an important thing I want to um, bring to your attention. If you're thinking about a case report and you have done the grunt work in the beginning, you've got all your articles. Now, uh, at this point in the game, you should decide which journal you're going to submit your article to. It's very important because all of your formatting of your case report will hinge on which journal you will submit your article to. So. My recommendation is to decide upon at least two, maybe three different journals. Uh, keep those in mind and go to those particular journal websites 
go to the journal websites and download their instructions to the authors. Instructions to the author is the most important document you can have when you're writing a, a case report because you can't go wrong by reading in detail and following every uh, line item of the instruction and how to uh, construct your abstract, how to construct your references, how they want the references listed. Some will like the references to be in the in the body of the report to be superscript. Some will like them to be uh, numbered at the end of the sentence or what have you. So make sure you understand and follow those directions. Uh, as far as spacing goes, uh, that's important. Uh, some will like to have it double spaced. Some will like single spaced. Uh, they will tell you what type of font to use. All that information is right there in the instructions to the author. So please go, be considering writing a case report, go to the journal's website and download their instructions to the authors. Very important. Next. Uh, process once you've decided on your journal is actually constructing the article according to what particulars of the particular journal. Okay, you're just not going to be willy nilly and just say, well, I'm just going to write up a narrative. That's not going to work. You're going to waste a lot of time if you do not follow uh, the instructions that the article that the journal has outlined for you. So please follow that. Pay attention to what they say and. Something that I don't know if it's unique to me uh, is I develop themes when I'm writing my case reports. And I'll show you on a different slide of what that's all about. When I say themes, I use the themes to sort my articles according to the themes. And I'll give you an example of a theme I might uh, use. For instance, if in this particular case, one theme might be epidemiology. Another theme might be therapy, a particular therapy. Another theme might be um, uh, defining uh, articles that define the particular uh, uh, condition. So coming up next, it will sh show you illustratively what this is all about, I think. Once I have, this is uh, just a, a short overview of what I'm presenting now. Once I've decided on the themes and sort the articles, and then I write the case. And I'll go through those uh, particular items in a little bit more detail uh, coming up next. Here's my workspace. And I think it's important for you as a potential author or authors, or if authors already, you've already done it, you've decided an environment where you're going to work, where you're most comfortable, where your ideas spring to life. <laughs> Here's what uh, where I where I am. I have a nice comfy chair, and I have my articles there in the nice box. I have my trusty MacBook in front of me, which I use to write my articles in Notepad. And I have my lamp because when it gets dark, so you need a good light source. And of course, off the screen, you can't see my bottle of wine, but that's a different uh, <laughs> take on the matter. In other words, be relaxed. You can't uh, write a good article if you're tense. At least I don't think anyway. So, um, and you can see the remote control on the arm <laughs> uh, of the chair as well. So I do watch a little TV, some movies, just to break the monotony sometimes, uh, because you're not going to sit there hour after hour and write this thing. You're going to actually uh, do it in stages. And that's the way I do it. I'll write a little bit here in the introduction. Once I finish that, I'll take a break, and then I'll come back and write the case report and on and on until it's done. And uh, so that's my process here. Here's what I'm talking about, the illustration of talking about sorting by themes. You can see here on the slide, you can see there is a stack of papers. And I have, uh, for illustration purposes, just uh, randomly put the uh, different titles on or themes on these particular stacks. And that helps you to organize, at least it helps me to organize my articles in such a way that I can actually go through them. When I'm writing my case report, this is a stack that I'm reading. Okay, it's organized. And by doing so, it also helps me to um, number my references. Because I go through these stacks, and after reading them, I will start to number the articles in that stack according to how they're listed, how I will have them listed in my case report. You know, 
number one. And oftentimes the numbers will change. And sometimes I will change your thought. Okay, I think this thought should be talked about before this thought. So I will change the order in which the references are. But just, uh, that's to say that this is the process that I go through. It may work, may not work for all individuals, but it works for me. So I sort by theme, it makes it easier to compartmentalize these, uh, the process in my mind, and it also helps me keep track of the references as I go through my, writing my article. Um, so you can see clearly that's how I do it. And by the way, you can look at this particular slide, you can see there's a lot of more articles left in the box. In other words, I may not use all the articles that I've retrieved. And uh, that's often, well, that, that is the case oftentimes that probably I will use maybe 50% of the articles that are actually retrieved and the rest will not be used, but I keep them anyway because they are good articles and uh, can be used for uh, future reference anyway. So, hope that helped you to dig into this quirky mind of mine to see how I sort them by, by theme. Now, let's get into the nuts and bolts of uh, writing the case report. Where do you start with that? This is the order in which I start, and I'll go through each one of these uh, bit by bit. I start with the case report. What is the case report? Some articles, some well, some journals rather, will um, have this title, they may call it something else. They may call it materials and methods or something like that. They don't always call it case report. But the case report is simply uh, writing the case in a sequential manner in which the patient presented into your office. We talked about having that information complete from the historical point of view and the physical examination point of view. That's why this is so important, because you have to lay it out in clear and concise terms to your reader. Uh, patient A presented on XYZ day with a complaint of spasms or whatever you want to call it. You pre you did another, you, you drilled down into the history, you got all this historical information, background information, you fill that in and now you can go into your physical examination, all the things that you did, your findings. findings. Uh, one uh, important thing I want to stress here, and we try to stress this with our interns, positive findings. What does that mean, actually? I used to teach my interns, never write down positive findings. Write down what happened. You performed this maneuver, and what did it do? In the same vein, in writing these case reports, you write writing your physical exam findings. You performed this particular maneuver, and it caused what to happen. Write it just like that. Uh, the interpretation is up to the reader, but it's pretty straightforward in my view. Avoid things like positive and negative because those uh, terms are pretty, uh, they can be pretty confusing. And uh, positive can mean one thing to one person and another to another. So let's try to keep it clear and concise for our readers. So. Outline your case report carefully. That's the part that I start with because it's the easiest uh, part of the <laughs> of writing the case report. You have that information there available. There's no thinking about it, just organizing it in a coherent way. Next part of the case report writing, I start with the introduction. Why do I start with the introduction rather than the discussion? Because for me, the introduction is simply that, introduction introducing the person to what I want to talk about later on. They give you a brief overview, or maybe some historical information about this particular case, some brief epidemiology about the case, how prevalent is this particular disorder in the population, blah, blah, blah. So it's easier for me to start there. It, it focuses me, uh, for one thing. That's why I start with the introduction. So everything else dovetails off of the introduction for me. and uh, references are used in your introduction. Usually about two to four references you can use in the introduction. The introduction should be not a long, long dis uh, discussion. That's, that's just discussion part. It can be more lengthy. But introduction should give your reader 
an introduction to if it's a diagnosis, to the diagnosis, the epidemiology, all that sort of information is included there. And so after the introduction, I will in turn go into the discussion of the case. And that's the more descriptive uh, uh, portion of writing your case report. It's more in depth and, and uh, it's, it's not as brief as uh, superficial as the introduction, so you're going more into depth. And you're talking about what did this particular case, what are some of the meanings of, or your findings rather, what kind of, uh, what importance or relevance this case might have to the profession as well as other groups outside of the profession. So you're discussing it there. And again, it's reference generally, because you're going to bring in some sources that uh, will support what you're saying. Um, and which uh, reminds me, whenever you're saying something, and whether it's your opinion, and try to stay away from opinions in your case report as much as you can. You can have an opinion, and we'll talk about the conclusion at the end. But as far as the discussion goes, um, if you're going to give an opinion, please have a reference to support your opinion. And your opinion should be um, supported in that vein. Uh, not just because you think it's a great idea. Why is it a great idea? Because Jones and Smith in their articles in 2010 supported what you're saying. Okay? After the discussion, then I moved to the conclusion. So now I have got all the information that I need. I've talked about the case. I've introduced the case. I've gone into depth about the case. So now I can make some conclusion about the case based on what I presented in the paper. So it should not be based on something you didn't mention in your paper. Hopefully not. The conclusion should be brief and concise again. And generally, there are no references in the conclusion. At least that's been my experience anyway. Um, so conclusions are just simple overview or, or final remarks about the case. And you can statement simply as, uh, well, I think this is a great case for the profession, but I think there should be more research uh, involved in elucidating why this is the way it is. You can say something like that. But there are other conclusions, uh, conclusive statements that you can look at as well. And one of the things that I do, just as an aside, uh, one of the things that I did when I was writing my first case report, and I knew which journal I wanted to submit it to, the JMPT. And that was my goal, to submit an article to the JMPT, because that was the big bad boy on the block uh, at that particular time. So I went to that journal, and what I did is I looked at similar cases, the cases in which uh, would be similar to the one that I wanted to write about. And I looked at their writing style. I looked at how long certain portions of the uh, parts of the article were. I looked at how they had the uh, formatting and all of that. So I, I did that to help me because I didn't have any training in writing. And so I had to seek out that on my own. And so I would recommend that to any aspiring author, go to the journals in which you think about submitting. Look at the way they present the cases. And that will help you in your own writing. Read the cases and see how they flow. Very helpful. So that was just an aside I wanted to share. After the conclusions, and then I will write the abstract. Now, different journals will have uh, different formats of the uh, abstract, so make sure you pay attention to what they want. Some will have structured abstracts, some will not have that structured abstract. And if you want to know what a structured abstract look, looks like, then go to the journal that specifies that, and you can see they'll have a certain format that you'll have to put it in. And it's abstract is not that long. It's just uh, each portion of the abstract or part of the abstract is usually maybe one or two sentences. And and so this is important, again, to download those instructions to the authors to follow the formatting of the particular journal. 
Lastly, I will format my references. As I talked about before, this is pretty easy now. Because what did I do before? I, I sorted my articles according to the themes, put them in various categories. I started to list them as far as numerically. I started to organize them according to their number in which they're going to appear or in my case report. So now it's just a matter of confirming numerically where they're coming in my article, making sure. You know, I don't want to you know, mistakenly write uh, a reference number two, and it actually was number three. So it's important to go back through the articles and identify where you put these reference numbers and making sure they coincide with your reference list that you'll have at the end of your article. And make sure you also that you format them correctly because, again, different journals will ask you to present them uh, references in different formats. Know how to uh, truncate, if you will, abbreviate journal titles. Some journals will have you to truncate journals or abbreviate them differently. So know how they uh, use the abbreviation for different journals as well in writing your references. And lastly, well, not lastly, but almost lastly, I come up with the title. You know, by this time, you should have some idea of what you want to call your article. And it should be pretty descriptive. Uh, title is something that is an eye catcher, if you will. Because typically, when people are looking at journal articles, what will catch their eyesight more often? First, the title. And then, what other portion? The conclusion. Because most people who they're scanning through journal articles and they're looking through journals, they're scanning the article, oh, okay, uh, the title. So that's a catchy title. That focus and interest. Okay, what does the conclusion say? Ah, huh. conclusion. There's something I might want to read about here, more in depth here. So it's important to put your title in the framework in which uh, it's succinct and it matches what you're presenting. And it shouldn't be overly long, and it should be very descriptive of what you're presenting. And lastly, the keywords, the mesh terms. This should not be uh, taken for granted because it's a very important for someone looking for similar cases to be able to retrieve your article. So how are they going to retrieve it when they put the words into our mesh terms into PubMed, certainly if they're looking for cases similar to yours, you would like for your article to spring up into that list of articles. So it's a very important to identify appropriate keywords for your particular case report. Know the mesh terms. I oftentimes, I will, because I'm familiar with mesh terms, I can pretty readily identify those, but I will also identify mesh terms that were used in articles that I retrieved, which are very helpful. Helpful. So, so there's always different ways of doing it, but don't ignore uh, the important aspect of keywords or mesh terms. Any journal, all journals will make, uh, well, require you to submit with your case report the recommended or terms that you recommend. They will not pick them for you. You'll have to do that yourself. Okay, finally. Now, you've written the case report and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. That's good. You've accomplished something and you should feel good about yourself. But guess what? After you've written it, please go back through the article, review it, revise it, and if you've done this for, or you're doing this for the first time, send this to some different eyes to look at for you. Content experts, someone that, uh, someone's opinion that you value that will critique your article objectively and will give you helpful comments. I can't uh, stress that enough. Send it out to some extra eyes to look at it and, and revise it for you before you submit it to your journal be very helpful. It will help you avoid some of the pitfalls before you actually submit it. Once you've done that, submit your article to the journal according to how they wish you to submit it, and they'll give you instructions on submission. I remember back in the day when I was doing this for the JMPT, 
we used to have to submit the article on floppy disk. Remember the old three and a half? Uh, you had to submit one copy on the floppy disk, and the other was hard copy, I believe. Uh, and now it's all electronic. So you upload your article electronically. They'll give you a password, and you go to their website, and they'll you just uh, upload it. So once you submit your article to the journal, and what do you do now? The time is <laughs> you'll find that you're waiting and waiting. Usually it takes about four to six weeks to get a response back from the journal. So you have to wait a little bit. That's okay. You can do some other things while you're waiting. Maybe uh, start writing on a different article. <laughs> and guess what will happen? Probably 99% of the time you will have to do some revision of your article because the journal will send it back because they will had will will have ha had uh, reviewers look at your articles. They have other content experts look at the article, review it, and make suggestions for improving the article. And please follow the recommendations of the reviewers. Respond to all the reviewers' questions, whether you think they are proper or not, in order for you to get your article submitted and not submitted, but published, you'll have to follow those directions to make sure that you have covered all the bases. So you have revised it according to the reviewer's recommendations, and you resubmit the article to the journal again. And what do you have to do next? Wait some more. And again, the turnaround time, depending on how many reviewers they have available for any particular journal, again, it'll take about four to six weeks to get a response from the journal saying yay or nay. Uh, it's important to pick your journal carefully, and I can't stress that enough. If you have gone to the journal and you've looked at the journal and they have never published any types of case reports like yours before, um, it may not be likely that they will publish your article in their particular journal. So. Search around, look and see what has been published in those particular journals, okay? So once you've waited, and hopefully you've gotten an affirmative response. But whether you have gotten a yay or a yes response, it's the process that's most important. You will know a whole lot more than you, you knew when you first went into this endeavor. Believe me, you'll become the content expert on that particular subject and you can't take that away from you. That knowledge is invaluable, and experience itself is invaluable. So I recommend everyone out there who is interested in uh, writing a case report, just do it. Um, here's a uh, just a, an overview, a schematic of the process of writing a case report, starting with where do you start, identify a, uh, you have an idea in your head, now you have the information, if the case report or the medical record is not up to snuff, you may have to do a retrospective look or a perspective look to gather information from the patient. And I didn't mention this, but make sure, according to the journal's own particulars, they may have you sign, have the patient sign their own um, uh, form. Uh, what do you call that form? The consent form. Thank you from the gallery. <laughs> uh, nowadays, each journal will have their own um, formatted consent form. So make sure before you publish anything relevant to a patient, whether that information is identifiable or not, hopefully it's not identifiable, and make sure that that patient has signed the consent form because the journals will ask for the consent form in addition to your other submissions. They'll ask for that form particularly. So nothing goes, nothing gets started until that form is submitted, signed, in proper due process. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that because that's an important step in this, because um, usually in case reports you're dealing with someone that's either alive or dead. Even if they're died, you have to have somebody to sign off, either a family member or someone that's over the estate or something to sign off giving consent. Um, so this is a schematic of the process and hopefully just an overview that will be helpful to you. This is a sample of the proof 
that I actually published something, <laughs> not just <laughs> talking, but that this is probably, well, it's not the last one. It's the next to the last one that uh, just had published back last year in the journal Chiropractic Medicine. And the title of the article uh, was Abdominal and Back Pain in a 65-Year-Old Patient with Metastatic Prostate Cancer. And that was published last year. And interestingly enough, when I submitted that article, I only had, I had four, four um, comments from the reviewers. And one of the four comments <laughs> simply stated, nice job, keep it up. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't know how to reply to that. <laughs> but that was nice. And uh, so at the end of your labor, treat yourself, toast, enjoy, you know, your check mark, whatever you do, but enjoy it. Um, it's a, something that uh, you can celebrate your accomplishment, whether you get published or not, it's an accomplishment. You've written the article, you submitted it, you have accomplished something in your life. So here's some references, uh, a reference rather, that might be uh, good for you to look at. And thank you very much. Any questions? Dr. Kramer. Absolutely. How long? First, outstanding presentation. I love the way that you go through all of the different items it's, uh, in your thought process. Very, very helpful. Um, how long does this process take you? Good question. Once I have settled into the idea of writing the case report, and uh, you really have to tell yourself, I'm ready to get into this type of thing. It takes me from start to finish. About two weeks from start to finish. Uh, not counting the time that it takes to retrieve the article. That's another maybe two weeks that you're looking at. So by the time I sit down and I have uh, gone through my, I've got a good case in mind. I've retrieved the literature. Now I've sorted my literature according to things. I've started to do a little idea checking in my mind with where, what kind of, Ideas I want to write about. I start new, uh, start uh, my reference numerical uh, confirmations and all of that, and then uh, yeah, two weeks. Tell my family members go away. Well, they know, you know, because once I get into that mode, and it's a mode, it's a frame of mind that you get into in writing things. Do you want it? You don't want to have any distractions, so quiet time. Once I go into that mode, then I come out of the cave. They know it's okay to interact with me. So it may be different for other people, but that's typically the, how long it takes me. And I'm going to put that again to the test over the break. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, have you ever written with another co-author? Have you ever shared that? Um, uh, you know, the whole process. And okay, you say it's collaborative case writing. Right. Yes, it's funny you should ask that. <laughs> Just recently, Dr. Christine Aikenhead and I, um, we wrote a collaborative case report. Uh, we submitted it to the Journal of Chiropractic Medicine. And just recently, uh, appeared in this month's uh, edition of the Journal of Chiropractic Medicine. That whole process between writing the writing the case report, uh, responding to the reviewers, resubmitting it, it took almost a year. So we, you know, we uh, <clears throat> we both had a hand in it. She provided the actual case because it was actually her her child, and it was a retrospective uh, case report, which was quite interesting. The child was, uh, she's now, what, she's now a teenager, but the case was actually when she was an infant. So she had a particular uh, uh, fascinating case that we wrote collaboratively on. Uh, we both did reference uh, searches. We both took a hand in each part of the case report, reviewing it, revising it, 
sending it back and forth to each other. So it was a dynamic experience. That's something that I think that if you if you have some type of relationship with other people, it can be quite a good idea. You learn a lot about yourself working with others. With some of their ideas, you have to temper your own ideas and just um, cooperate for the better of the <laughs> the project. Um, but it was a good experience. That was the first time that I had done something like that before, and I was quite pleased with the outcome. So. Yes. Thank you. Has um, uh, going through the uh, case report writing process affected your um, your practice? Uh, you're dealing with patients, patient encounters, um, et cetera. How is it? Well. Here's my point of view, and I try to stress this with uh, the clinicians as well. I, I stress that when you're seeing a patient, every patient should be seen as a, as a case report. You're recording in, in the patient file, record it as though it could be, be a potential case report. That means that you have dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's relative to this particular patient. So it improves your documentation, I think. I think that's the biggest uh, um, overflow from this whole process is that it improves your documentation. Obviously, if it improves your documentation, it's going to improve your patient care, the outcome of patient care. Approximately how many references do you end up using on a case report? I know you pulled several hundred in some cases, how many do you end up? Yeah, the question is how many case, uh, how many references do you actually use in a case report? And that can vary. Um, and I think most journals will say probably cut off that for a particular case report is probably like 20, 25. And it could be as small as maybe 10 or 15. But you don't want to be extensive. You don't want to go into a literature review. That's different from a case report. So there is a limit to how many references you can use. And the case report is typically shorter than most presentation in journals anyway. Um, I think on my first, I might have exceeded the norm on my first case report submitted to the JMBT. I think I used it in excess of 40. Because the reason I did that, because there was, that was at the advent of the PSA when I used that. That was just becoming uh, into the mainstream as a diagnostic or screening tool for prostate cancer. And so I had to provide a lot of background information there, um, I felt anyway, uh, um, to support the utilization of the PSA as a regular diagnostic uh, tool because a lot of people hadn't heard of the PSA in that particular usage before. Had to that's why I use more references than typically recommended in a um, case report. But there are exceptions, of course, and probably a journals will look at exceptions if it's uh, well founded. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, for the, this uh, outstanding presentation and for your thorough answering the questions. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> Is that it? Do I hit something? Or? I think she stopped. <laughs> you stopped recording? Yes, I stopped recording. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Good job, Ted. Does that help a little bit having people share it? And do it? <laughs> I don't know if it helped. It helped having somebody in the room, actually, okay. because I, I, it was very difficult trying to do this with nobody to look at. Mm -hmm. So even when I can see Barbara right there, I even looked at her in the corner there, <laughs> and so I was looking at different faces while I was doing that. So it was great. That another great job. That was really good. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this off of your computer. Thomas, you can open the door for everyone. So I can leave the meeting? Right.